America. My name is I'm Yosef Frimpong. I come to you live every Friday about this time to talk to you about the news of the day. And today we're going to talk about the double day. The double day is a theory that women really get screwed because if they go into work, they go work all day, then they come home and they have to do like all of the work of cooking, cleaning, and taking care of the kids, which is a lot of work. So it's kind of a double day. So the imperative that women go into the workforce ends up being um, kind of a mixed blessing. And so there's also something called the Black Double Day, where black people, this is coined by me, where black people are supposed to do the job they're supposed to do, and also a whole other job, which is making white people feel comfortable about the standing degradation, which is black life in America. All right, so it's two jobs. You got to make... Uh, white people, uh, you have to do your job, whatever your job is, and then you also have to make white people feel comfortable um, in America. And this is like, this is, depending on who you talk to, this is the order of every institution. If you are a writer, you have to write well and also write in a way that makes white people feel comfortable. If you are a teacher, you have to teach well, but also teach in a way that makes white people feel comfortable. You have to, if you're a judge, you have to judge well. But uh, if you read some critical le uh, legal theorists or critical race theorists, you have to judge and render verdicts also in a way that make white people feel comfortable about their interests. Right? So this double day is real. And the latest person who was taxed, because that's what it, it tantamount to, uh, it's tantamount to a tax, is Gwen Berry. Gwen Berry. Um, you know, has some opinions about the United States and she wanted to express them uh, <laughs> like on the podium because she was on the podium. And in my view, if you get on the podium, you get to be who you want. You're what you call a free Negro. But apparently some people are calling for her to be kicked off the United States team because she didn't behave in a way that makes white people comfortable. Well, and then they say that well, you know, she's not representative. She has to represent the nation. And if she doesn't want to represent the nation, then she shouldn't be on the team. Yeah, she is representing the nation. This, the, I don't know if you can find a more representative picture of America. Like, that's America. The, the, like, I don't know what is more representative. But, but when people say represent the nation, they mean look uh, the other way at white perfidy. And what she's not doing is looking the other way at white perfidy. She's looking right at it. <laughs> looking right at the camera. I see you, and I see you see us. And that is perfectly fine. So she, had, Gwendolyn Berry has two jobs, to throw a hammer and also to make white people feel comfortable about America. That is unfortunate, and I hope she denies her second job because... Well, I'll talk to you a, a, a little bit later um, after I hit the opening. To the beach, yo. Uh, yeah. Sound good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state the facts. You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. To the beach, yo. To the beach, yo. Yeah, you're all trying to tell me that Gwendolyn Berry, Gwen Berry doesn't represent America. That's, that's just hilarious. This is America. This is, this, is, this is America. This just isn't the America that white people feel comfortable with, so it's the America we keep quiet. Well, this is, we, can't, we can't be out loud. We can't be black. This is what happens when you can't be black in public. This is black America in public. She gets to be 100% American and 100% black, which means, like, this is her life in America. And that's probably as representative of her American life as any other picture of America. Like, I don't, I don't, she gets to be an American. And those of you policing her in her Americanness, like, have some history books to read. All right, so she, yeah, you, you, black people have two jobs. One, do the job, in her case, throw the hammer. Two, make white Americans feel good about America. That is unfortunate, and if we have two jobs, we should get two paychecks. There shouldn't be a black tax. There should be a black bonus. The only person in America who gets paid a black bonus is Obama and Oprah. <laughs> um, maybe John Lewis, you know, when he was alive. 
and, and actually probably Jim Clyburn, right? So they're the only people who get a black bonus. Everybody else is getting a black tax uh, by, because of the extra work. Those other people perform the extra work of being black and doing the job, but uh, they perform being black in a way that's not necessarily good for black communities. So they still do two jobs. They just do it in a way that, you know, actually furthers the illusion and the institutions that thrive on the illusion of racial justice. All right. So real quickly, I want to talk about a little bit about uh, Richardson, Shigari Richardson. All right. So my deal isn't that she got caught smoking pot and is now kicked off the team. I feel, I feel like that's sad. I would like her to run if she wants to run. Maybe do a PSA or something like that. I don't know. Like, I don't, um, I think she should run if she wants to run. But my deal is, my deal is, well, how come she, it's a, it's a problem of networking, right? So we know that white athletes smoke pot and do all sorts of things, but they also have the network of friends who help them get away with it. And you could do anything from like delaying the test results to just showing you the masking drugs or say like giving you a schedule saying make sure you don't smoke here and here's when they're going to test. There are all of these networking things that allow white people to be degenerates and still also be Olympic champions, right? And so what I see in that case is that she was just left out of the network. She didn't have the right friends who would hook her up with the ways to beat the test. Right? And you can say, like, well, you know, Carl Lewis failed some drug tests, too. The thing about Carl Lewis drug test, failed a drug test, I think, he, like, I, I, it was a Cold War, right? So I think that Carl Lewis had the Cold War fighting, uh, like, working for him. <laughs> we wanted to win. It was the Cold War. And there was an interest convergence of, of white elite interests and Carl Lewis. And, and that's how he, he survived, right? But without the Cold War, like, Shikari's on her own. Now, that's unfortunate, but she shouldn't just be on her own. That's the issue that makes, that makes this an interesting story for me. How come she's not networked with the kind of athlete slash... I mean, like a third of the Olympic team is going to be addicted to pain pills because you get an injury, because they all have injuries, and then they take a pill, and then they get addicted to the pills, and they still have a little bit of the injury left, but they have just enough injury to re... Um, to re, uh, re-prescribe the pills. So they're addicted to pills. So like a lot of Olympians are addicted to pills and that kind of goes, right? So how come she wasn't hooked into the friendship networks that would help her live a life where she smokes pot and becomes an Olympic champion? That's the interest for me because I do think that there are other Olympic athletes with drug problems who are going to go because they have their friends tell them, all right, make sure you're clean from these days out. You got to be clean for 30 days. Here, drink a lot of water. Here, make sure this washes out of your system. Here, get a haircut. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, like, whatever. Um, here, like, have this bill. It'll uh, drink this. It'll mask it for 30, 30 hours or whatever. She had none of that. It was just Shikari from the hood um, you know, running fast and getting caught, right? In the same way that black or white people smoke a lot of weed, but they don't go in jail. White Olympic at go to jail. White Olympic athletes smoke a lot of weed, but they still get to be Olympic athletes. You're trying, you're trying to tell me that Ryan Lotke, like, was sober or any of those, uh, <laughs> any of those Olympic swimmers who I, you know, I like fine. But you're trying to tell me that they like weren't smoking in the Olympic Village, <laughs> right? So um, I don't know. So this is, I feel like maybe bad PR and legal advice to have a cop to it so early as opposed to fight it. Because once again, if you're black and alone, nobody tells you what to fight and what not to fight. And th that's, so that's a thing. But also... Um, prior to her getting caught, like the friendship networks that would have told her how to mask it and not get caught. Like they just evaporate. And I, I think that's indicative of black life in general. Like the, the, the infrastructure, the social infrastructure 
to get away with bad behaviors. I mean, man, I'm thinking like a third, like two thirds. Of, <laughs> I said a third, then I said two thirds. I might go half. Half of the contractors in this great state of Georgia, the white contractors in this state of Georgia are just drunks, right? Like, so I'm thinking they just drink, they get hung over, and then they come and do carpentry or whatever. And they're allowed to do it because of like the hookup or like if they're working for their uncle, they're coming in hungover and their uncle doesn't fire them because of you know the hookup. So there was like a infrastructure, a friendship infrastructure that Richardson lacked that I that is unfortunate. Um, so I guess the Black Double Day has two jobs. You have to do the job run fast, but also find a way to get into the friendship infrastructure that will uh support any of your untoward behaviors if that's the case right so that's another way of having a two job you would think her job would just to be to run fast but no she also has to make sure that she's hooked up with the right um you know network that will look out for her in these situations um and make sure she's acculturated into how to smoke pot and be an olympic champion because there are, no make no mistake there are quite a few olympic champions who are hooked up into the network of how to smoke pot and be an Olympic champion, right? So the Black Double Day has manifest, um, has, 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 has manifest manifestations, many, 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 many different manifestations, right? So her circle failed her. Yeah, that's, that's what someone's saying. Her circle failed her. And not because her circle failed her because they didn't get her, like, get the charge kicked. Her circle failed her because the real circle's job is in the preliminary work telling her when to smoke, when not to smoke, what to drink to make sure she gets away with it, all of these other things. Like, that's the informal work that allows, you know, a lot of white athletes to live their degraded life while being, um, you know, uh, Olympic champions, right? Also, once again, I want to give a shout out to the real black American. She's the realest one out there. There you go, Gwen Berry doing two jobs, throwing a hammer and working for us, right? So the real black double day is where you're supposed to do two jobs. She's supposed to both throw a hammer and uh, uh, be polite and pretend, feign ignorance. She's supposed to be Jackie Robinson. Because remember, Jackie Robinson had, had two days, right? I had two jobs. Jackie Robinson's job was to hit the baseball and also to be polite to white people who treated him like trash. Other people could hit the baseball, but they wouldn't be polite to white people who treated them like trash, so they didn't get called up to the major leagues. Jackie Robinson, <laughs> Jackie Robinson got paid two-thirds of the money to do twice the work because he had two jobs. Um, and so that's what I say about that in the Black Double Day. Um, I, think it's, I think it's unfortunate that we have to pretend that we aren't American because we're American. Even I'm American. My name is Ayame Osei Frimpong. And I'm still American because I was born in Los Angeles. <laughs> like I was born in Los My dad was born in Ghana. He came here. My mom was born in South Carolina. Um, but I'm American. I'm not going back to Ghana because no, I was never there. I was in Los Angeles. So, and I'm going to be American like I'm going to be American. right? So, we are American. And this is when I say, well, some people, some black nationals will be like, well, we should have our own Olympics. We should have our own Olympics and not go with the white man's Olympics. No, I want to be an Olympic champion. I want to be an Olympic champion from the nation I am. I want all the support of the U.S. Olympic Committee. I also also want to be black. So I'm a fan of integrating Olympic teams. I just don't think we should be made to integrate on our knees. And there is a sister who is not integrating on her knees. She's integrating standing up. right? And so that's how I think we should pitch and understand the role of, of both integration, being a black American, and being an American who's black. And, you know, we don't let other people take away our American identity. We are American. And, you know, this is why white people don't grow. <laughs> so her job is to, like, let me just get through this, right? So her job is to represent America, not make you feel good about the nation. Her job is to represent America, not make white Americans feel good about America, right? It's her country. It doesn't mean that she has to like it as is. It just means that it's hers. And I, I said before, this is why white people don't grow as people. They identify with their flaws and then feel entitled to expect other people to accommodate them in their flaws because the flaws are theirs. And if you disrespect my flaws, you disrespect me. No, man. 
Like, that's not how it works. You just expect the world to coddle you and accommodate your flaws. And that's just not, I mean, we're not going to shut off our brains like that, right? So, and black self-determination is not premised on coddling white America's conception of itself. So, thank you for your time. I hope this has been educational. By the way, if you like what I'm doing, which you should, because I, I think I do it pretty well, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month to go on Patreon and, and kick in what you can kick on. Because depending on who you talk to, I'm making myself down white unemployable. I'm giving myself a pay cut by being black for you, because I I can't be free alone. I need I need to raise my people up with me so we can be free together. Um, so you can supplement the pay cut I get, <laughs> I tell you, I am taking by, um, not being a respectable Negro and go to www.funkyacademic.com. Uh, Cause you know, I have bills to pay too. And I'd like to grow this and get a marketing budget and stuff like that. Also, I should be on a segment that, uh, Crystal Ball and Saga and Jetty's, um, podcast breaking points, um, podcast slash YouTube show Breaking Points. I should, there's a segment that should drop in a few days, so keep an eye on that. I'm about to, once I sign off here, I'm immediately, this is why I have a show, immediately about to talk to Brianna Joy Gray, who I like. I think she's great. And she always looks fabulous. So that's why I put on a shirt. She always looks like, I'm Brianna, but Miss Gray, if you're nasty. Um, she's always, she's always, she always looks fabulous. So I'm about to go on her show once I get off of here and talk about critical race theory. So check that out. Um, Cause I think she does good work and, and she's a good black leftist. And uh, by the way, you know, you should, you should support your black leftist. Tim Black does a pretty, uh, <laughs> he does a fantastic job. Support him, support Brianna, support myself. Uh, because if you don't, you know, the lack of a black left is going to kill your candidate. We killed, Bernie, we killed Bernie Sanders in 2016. We killed Bernie Sanders in 2020. You need white left. You need me. If you would have given me a $500,000 back in 2016, Bernie Sanders wouldn't have gotten slaughtered in South Carolina. I'm not saying he would have won, but I could have like worked the body, right? I could have used that money to grow the message because depending on who you talk to, I'm compelling and I would have, you know, um, but so like invest in a black left because it shows you, the white left needs to like, there's an interest conversion, <laughs> convergence between the white left and the black left um, if we're serious about a left politics in the United States. With that, I'm gonna let you go. Peace. <laughs>